Let's be honest, the chance to control photons and force fields to create literally anything from our imagination leaves us with a wide open field of what we can do on a holodeck. It also leaves things open to get really weird. With that in mind, I'm Sean Ferrick for Trek Culture, and here are the 10 weirdest holodeck episodes. Number 10, Emergence. No, it's not another one of Kenneth Branagh's Agatha Christie adaptations, it's just a holographic mashup on the Orient Express. Have your tickets at the ready for Keystone and New Vertiform City. As detailed in The Star Trek The Next Generation Companion, Branagh Braga had wanted one last trip to the holodeck before the end of TNG. His idea to revisit Dixon Hill was rejected in favour of the ultimate holodeck show, and that's certainly what we got. When Data, Worf and Riker re-enter the holodeck in emergence, Data estimates that one scene alone consists of portions of seven distinct holodeck programs. As if the final product weren't odd enough, the first draft of the script was apparently even weirder, as producer-showrunner Jerry Taylor is cited as saying in The Next Gen Companion. Cliff Bowl, the episode's director, further commented, I thought Joe Minoski, who wrote the telebrief for Emergence, might have had a couple of mushrooms when he wrote that first script. For the sake of the filming schedule, things had to be pared down from extremely mad to just mad. The nub of the episode is that the Enterprise D itself is becoming sentient and is, in essence, having a baby. The holodeck then is becoming a manifestation of the ship's rudimentary but developed psyche. Ultimately, the weirdest thing about Emergence is that we've never seen nor heard of the Enterprise D's offspring since it flew the nest. Number 9. Unexpected There are only two relatively brief scenes on the Zyrillian version of a holodeck in this episode of Enterprise, but the first, odd in and of itself, sets off a whole chain of bizarre events. The lesson is never stick your hands in alien granules, even if they are just resequenced photons. This is one situation they never taught you in sex education. Being the prequel that it was, the inclusion of holodeck-type technology in Enterprise was more unusual to the characters than it could have been for the viewer. It's little wonder that Trip had difficulty standing up straight in the boat and keeping his members out of strange objects. Upon seeing the holographic environment for the first time, the commander makes a comparison with the 3D simulator, presumably already commonplace on Earth, since it is already in our present day. By the end of Unexpected, the Klingons had also bullied the Zyridians into giving them the holographic tech. As we all know, the Enterprise episode's title achieves its wordplay when Mr. Tucker falls not just nearly off the boat, pregnant too. Beyond the debates that have been had about this over the years, and rightly so, we can say that Connor Trenier certainly adds layers to the screwball comedy script he'd been given. Without his performance, the whole concept and the nipple might have just been a bit too weird. Number 8. Our Man Bashir Star Trek is, no doubt, at its best and wackiest when the most elaborate of sci-fi premises are really just an excuse for a James Bond episode. The holodeck is already a great medium for the writers to let their imaginations run wild, but combine that with a complex transporter problem and you've hit peak weird. Julian Bashir, must avoid doing the James Bond reverse name thing, plays the titular role and Garrick is the real Miss Moneypenny. Really, what could go wrong? If you thought Voyager was cavalier with his ox craft, DS9's runabout is barely on screen before it explodes in Arman Bashir. The transporter is knocked out of commission mid beam out, and Cisco, Dax, Kira, Worf, and O'Brien's patterns start to degrade in the buffer. Then, the holographic hijinks begin. Where to put all that data? You can't just dig out a couple of external hard drives. The solution is to transfer the information everywhere. All of the five physical patterns wind up on the holodeck with an initially baffled Garrick and Bashir, but their neural energy, because that has to be stored on the quantum level, finds its way to every last bit of computer memory the station has to offer. In modern parlance, they'd been uploaded to the cloud. Bashir and Garrick are forced to play out the secret agent program to its conclusion, with their friends and colleagues quite literally inhabiting the supporting roles. Number 7. 11001001 Without missing a bit, we've all tried, and probably failed, to recall what is undeniably one of the most unusual episode titles in all of Star Trek. If you do have trouble remembering it, you'll be thrilled to discover that 11001001 of Star Trek The Next Generation's first season was, in fact, called 10101001 in earlier drafts of the script. For the 8-bit binary sequence that was chosen, there are several solutions, but only really one interpretation that fits. Each binar has a bit pair name, like 11, and there are always two binars together in a unified pair, like 10 and 01. The title is therefore 11 with 00, 10 with 01. Now, here's a quick question from the Starfleet entrance exam. If there's any kind of potential problem with the antimatter containment fields, you should A. Keep on painting. B. 
Notify the captain and first officer immediately. C. Not try to contact the captain and first officer until things get much worse because they've got far more important things to do, like chatting up a hologram on the holodeck. Or D. Blame Wesley. Well, we hope you answered correctly because Data and Geordi certainly didn't. Meanwhile, Minuet's keeping Riker and Picard busy with some questionable French. Plus, let's just hope she was lying when she professed her love for jazz. I'm not purging all that loosey-goosey out of the system again. Number six, author, author. A hologram who writes a holo novel in which the protagonist is an exaggerated version, ish, of himself, the hologram, sounds these days less like science fiction, more like ChatGPT is having an early midlife crisis. Author Author is certainly up there with the stranger episodes of Star Trek Full Stop, and not least for the moustache. Persons with vascular disorders should consult a physician before running this program. What happens on the holodeck rarely stays on the holodeck in Star Trek Voyager. In this case, it caused an interquadrantal incident. The Doctor's Star Trek Vortex, the B-movie, might well have been about as subtle as a Ferengi mating dance, his write-what-you-know feeling at times more like a transcription, but that was rather the point, to tell an important tale through his own lens. This was the there-it-sits moment for the Doctor and his fellow EMHs in a smoking jacket quill at the ready. Seeing Captain Jenkins phaser a crew member dead in sickbay was wild enough, but then things get even weirder when Lieutenant I'm um, here for my physical, Marseille, okay, Tom Paris, makes a few changes to the Doctor's working draft. All aboard the Starship Voyeur. The Doctor wasn't declared a person in the episode, but as an artist, he did get one up on the replicator. Number five, a bunch of Barclays. Many members of the Star Trek community can relate to Lieutenant Reginald Barclay, including those who are autistic. A stranger in a strange world, it is not he who is weird, but those around him. Barclay's is a story of success, but only as much on his terms as the 24th century would seem to allow. There are limits to, of course, and fencing with holographic versions of the crew and creating the goddess of empathy was no doubt one of them. Frankly speaking, at the beginning of Hollow Pursuits, everyone around Barclay, aside from Guinan and Counselor Troy, acts like a bunch of jerks. The engineering team can't help but laugh at Barclay behind his back, adopting the derisive nickname invented by Wesley, who himself insists on talking over the lieutenant whenever he gets the opportunity. Geordi is abrupt and abrasive, even wanting Barclay out of engineering, until Captain Picard tells him otherwise. All of Barclay's colleagues have to be persuaded to show him even a modicum of understanding and respect. Of course, all of that is, no doubt, the idea behind Hollow Pursuits, to shine a fictional light on real-world issues. Nevertheless, it always strikes us odd that, by the 24th century, Barclay's difference remains a problem in need of a solution, that acceptance, understanding, and adjustment in and of the workplace isn't a given. The matter is far from resolved for Barclay, as he faces similar, although perhaps more well-intentioned, pushback from colleagues in the Star Trek Voyager episodes Pathfinder and Inside Man. Number 4. A Fistful of Datas Technically speaking, Barclay plays a formative role in this episode too, although he never makes a physical appearance. The young Alexander, sorry Worf, that would be your son, tells his father that the lieutenant helped a little with his holo program. Originally called The Good, The Bad and The Klingon, A Fistful of Datas is really a mad triumph of Brent Spiner's. There are two rules of 90s Star Trek. First rule, everything that can go wrong will go wrong, especially during downtime. Second rule, Murphy's Law loves the holodeck. More precisely, if you hook data up to the ship's computers and start tinkering around, something's gonna malfunction in the weirdest way. A power surge in data's positronic subprocessors sends ripples of the android throughout the ship and onto the holodeck where Troy, Worf, and Alexander are playing their ancient western. There, Spiner runs the gamut of the weird and wonderful through Data's holographic doppelgangers. The impetus is also reversed in that Data himself starts behaving at moments like he's Clint Eastwood, from his accidental southern drawl to his cowboy swagger and misuse of a plant pot in the observation lounge. Patrick Stewart also pulled double duty as both actor in and director of this unorthodox but brilliant episode. Number three, The Killing Game. The cold opener gets the two-parter off to a start as it's bold as it is out of the ordinary. Captain Jamie's a Klingon now. No, wait, hang on. There's a Herogen and he's calling Sick Bay from Holodeck 2 because he's just stabbed Janeway. What in the goddamn Delta Quadrant? Naturally, the Herogen had conquered Voyager just to turn it into one giant holodeck for their sick little game. Klingon swordsmanship and heavy drinking aside, it's not long before Godwin's law of Star Trek episodes kicks in and most of the crew find themselves believing they're in World War II. Janeway switches roles with Chakotay as head of the Resistance and Seven of Nine is cut off mid-song. Things just get weirder from there, not least with that pop quiz in the corridor. The Doctor didn't have to lug around his mobile emitter for a while, at least, so that's something. Number two, the practical Joker. 
Kirk is a jerk and Scotty is left pie-faced when the Enterprise computer starts to take on a mind of its own after its circuits are affected by a highly charged subatomic particles. At first pulling relatively harmless pranks to amuse itself, the computer ups the ante by trapping Dr. McCoy, Sulu and Uhura in the rec room, the 23rd century equivalent of a holodeck. The environment switches from woodland to arctic blizzard to enormous hedge maze before two crew members manage to pry the doors open from the outside. 14 years before the events of the Practical Joker and 105 years after after Unexpected, the USS Discovery had its own fairly realistic holographic simulation room used for target practice in the episode Leith. Gene Roddenberry had wanted to include a version of the Practical Joker's rec room in the third season of Star Trek the original series, but without even holographic dollars left in the budget, this would have to wait until Encounter at Farpoint. In all that time, however, they still hadn't worked out the kinks. Number 1. These are the Voyages it's the ending to Star Trek Enterprise nobody wanted, and the deleted scenes from the Pegasus nobody needed. As Bran and Braga once said, it was the only time Scott Bakula got pissed off at him, and frankly we don't blame him. After all, These Are The Voyages is a weird holodeck episode, and it's weird because it's a holodeck episode in the first place. As a series, Enterprise was coming to a very abrupt end. Cancellation had, alas, finally caught up with it. Producers had to do something for the very last episode, but instead they did this. A skip forward in time is fine, we can deal with that. If we aren't going to get through three more seasons, at least we can catch a glimpse at where the story was headed. At the founding of the Federation, perhaps? It's all an illusion, however. Commander Riker stands up, freezes, saves, and ends the program. The main problem with having all of the 22nd century scenes set on the holodeck is that it leaves room for doubt. Maybe the program's off, as Deanna Troy herself says in the episode. The whole thing can only ever be the computer's interpretation of 209-year-old events. For perspective, if not an entirely fair comparison, for us in 2024, that's as far back as the Battle of Waterloo. Star Trek Picard's third season confirmed that the NX-01 had been refitted, naturally, before decommissioning, but this wasn't included in Riker's Hollow program. With the historical veracity of These Are The Voyagers in more doubt than ever, therefore, we'd like to reiterate, Trip's not dead. That's everything for this list, folks. Thank you so much, as ever, to the wonderful Jack Kiley for writing this for us, you absolute legend. Thank you very much, Tom, for making this list look pretty. Everyone, make sure that you're following us over on Twitter, at Trek Culture. We're also on Blue Sky and TikTok at Trek Culture as well. Make sure that you're following us on Instagram, at Trek Culture YT. You are awesome, you are wonderful. I hope that your 2024 has been good to you so far. If it hasn't, then it's only up from here. Be kind to yourself, be kind to everyone else, look after yourself, and live long and prosper. Thanks very much.